I'd like to read a few passages from 1 Peter. And, you know, a lot of the letters to these early communities of the followers of Jesus were, had to do with advice about how to get along uh, together as communities because they were playing with this new thing of gathering in community and taking care of each other. As you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth so that you might have genuine affection for your fellow believers, love each other deeply and earnestly. Do this because you have been given new birth, not from the type of seed that decays, but from seed that doesn't. This seed is God's life-giving and enduring word. All of you be of one mind, sympathetic, lovers of your fellow believers, compassionate and modest in your opinion of yourselves. Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, give blessing in return. You were called to do this so that you might inherit a blessing. Above all, show sincere love to each other because love brings about the forgiveness of many sins. Open your homes to each other without complaining and serve each other according to the gift each person has received as good managers of God's diverse gifts. It's true, I come from an uncomplicated family. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I don't take particular credit for it. But it's been true, which is probably why I have the time and energy to worry about other people and their families. <laughs> We've been preaching about families all summer, and it's, uh, personally, it's been delightful both to preach on the subject and to hear these sermons over the course of these numbers of weeks. And this is kind of the last one in the series. And it seems to me only appropriate that we might continue, as we have been, I think, throughout this series, to open up the circle of what it means to talk about family. What are we talking about when we talk about family? And can we take that step, that mystical step, the mystical union of all, the family of all? In the past, we might have called that the family of man. We're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> For a couple of reasons, not just that it's sexist, but because it also, when you say all, you know, it opens up that possibility that we're also not just talking about kind of human beings, but we're talking about everything, like those plants that we saw on that slide. That is part of the all, too, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I, I, ha I started to get this. Um, there's a, there's a, a blessing, a, a meal blessing that I heard first in Unitarian Universalist circles, and I can't remember it, but I bet someone in here knows it's this, the, it's the one that ends about all the animals and the vegetables and the minerals and, that made it possible. Does anyone know that one? Da, 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 da. Okay, it's not ringing too many bells with you. <laughs> but anyway, at the last of it, you know, we're giving thanks, and it's, you know, and the animals and the vegetables and the minerals that make it possible. So as we think about all, this all, even though mostly what I'm talking about this morning is our relationship between our fellow human beings, we might just open that circle even a little bit wider to include all the animals, which includes us, you remember, all the vegetables, and all the minerals. And I don't know if there are any other categories that that doesn't quite cover, but if there are, we'll just kind of consider that. Microbes, I don't know. I guess those are animals. We are called, it seems to me, by the words of the Gospels in particular, to continue to extend our love and our care and concern beyond the small circles of our families, that we are supposed to think of ourselves as siblings, brothers, sisters, all. If we are to love our enemies, that certainly explodes that circle, doesn't it? That opens up that circle. Even we're not even supposed to exclude the people that drive us crazy. I realize that I did not say that, but, um, but someone shouted it out so I don't have to take responsibility for naming political candidates in presidential elections. 
But we are called by the Gospels to have that open-handed love. And I would suggest that this is in stark contrast to a political and social point of view that says we take care of our own. This is in stark mm -hmm. contrast to a political and social point of view that says we just take care of our own. And when you say own, I'm going to take care of my own, that circle is very, very small. That language is the language of borders. It's the language of us and them. And even though there are perfectly valid reasons to understand the differences and to respect the differences between us and to understand that not everyone's experience is our own, there's also a point at which we need to open that circle as wide, sometimes as wide as we can possibly imagine, sometimes as wide, wider than we can imagine, a wideness that can only be, be held by the wonder of God. We don't have to do all this work. God is holding that largest circle that we can hardly wrap our heads around. But every once in a while, we get to delight and live in the mystical union of all things. What does this mean for us? That means that as we work our way through the world, that if we keep that point of view it will change the way that we see others. It will change the way that we see the world. It will change the way that we see politics or, or culture and allow us to open, to open, which is only possible when we are fed by love. It's very challenging in the world if you are feeling beleaguered or oppressed to be open when you are spending all your time and energy really just trying to take care of yourself. But when we can find the strength of spirit, we can, when we can find the reality of God in our lives, we, we have that possibility of opening up, even if it's only for instance, for brief moments where we can see how we are all connected and how the good of all is the, the best good for us, the good for all. It's what is good for us. I was telling a story to a group of my interplay friends. Some of you may have seen a photograph of me on Facebook in my Batman underwear. <laughs> on the outside, I'm starting a new fashion trend. And I told that gathered group of people that I was wearing my Batman in, uh, underwear because, you know, it's not until the superheroes uh, put their costumes on that they're taken seriously. <laughs> and so I had mine on so that people would take me seriously. <laughs> and I had my eracism t-shirt that I had just bought at that gathering on as well. And I was talking to them about just a simple idea. And I think this, this simple idea, because you know, one of the things uh, that I sometimes say is that if we have the opportunity to say that systems should be dismantled, we should also give people some ideas about how we might do that. We might give people a little instruction book or just even a simple idea. Well, first of all, I think the idea of the family of all, just having that point of view is a way to dismantle some of our systems. If we walked through the world, if we voted, if we uh, made policy based on that kind of idea, things would certainly change. But to be more specific, in that story I was talking about, you know, in that age from about, oh, let's say 13, 14, 15, to maybe 23, 24, 25, so you just want you to imagine that, and especially, you know, just for this morning, I want you to think about boys. It's not just boys, but this is a time to get into trouble. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> and if you get in trouble during that period of time? No. Oh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I have an uncomplicated family. Mo was never in trouble when he was <laughs> that age. You know, this is a time where people are experimenting. They're doing things they shouldn't. They're under the influence of their peers. They don't listen to their parents. Blah, blah, blah. But what happens when, when kids do get in trouble? You know, if you have a family who has position or means or stature or some sense of power, that family is going to do everything they can to keep that child out of the system so that they don't have to suffer for the rest of their lives for the stupid things they did when they were teenagers. 
what if we were to take exactly that same attitude as a culture, as a society, toward anyone of any race, any class, any culture, who got into trouble, who did a, 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 a silly thing, or even a dangerous thing? What if we had that kind of attitude toward every single one of those young people? Especially the ones who may not have the means to escape the system. My partner, Chin, has three children. His oldest child, his son, came here to the United States with Chin and his wife when he was one. I can only imagine what, you know, when you're that young, you never know what's ha what's, what effect things have happened. But here's this baby who escaped by a boat across the Gulf of Thailand, was in a, a refugee camp in Malaysia, was relocated by plane to San Francisco, grew up in East Palo Alto. Who knows what all of that had, what effect that had on him. And quite frankly, when he was a teenager and a slightly older, he got into trouble. And he ended up in the system. And as we were going through that period of time, my, I, I have connections to Chin's uh, children, but because they were older when Chin and I got together, I don't have, I don't, definitely don't have that kind of um, stepfather relationship with them. But they're children that I love because I love Chin. And I often wondered what would have happened if I had showed up when Huey was going to court. How would that have been different if a white man had showed up in that court alongside this young Asian man? Or even to show up alongside Chin, who might not have the same kind of, you know, you know, you know we have, I, I, I could just imagine that if I were in that system, I would be coming in with a little bit of that. You know, whatever that is. You know, a little bit of sense of... But I'm not sure that Chin was in a position to do that. Or that they, they had the, the support to do that for Huey. I'm sure they did everything they can. But I just always kind of wondered, how might it have been different if I had showed up? And what if we thought of every child in this congregation as deserving of that kind of support? And what if we brought the full force of our support to those situations in that period of time when people do things, they get in trouble, but they should not have to pay the consequences for the rest of their lives? So when we think of the family of all, even just having that frame It's much harder to build those walls. It's much harder to think of the other. It's much harder to say, no, this is the way it is. You do not fit in here. It's much harder to say, well, because you come from this place, this station, these are going to be the consequences for you. When we have that frame of the family of all, it can change everything. We cannot do this on our own, or even as this community, or a wide community. We can only accomplish this mystical unity, in my opinion, through our connection to God. Because it needs that much power, that much spirit, that much grounding, that much essential truth. So as we expand that circle, remember to rely on the most basic source, the creator of the animals and the vegetables and the minerals. Amen.